My favourite study, and there have been a few of them, but these doctors in Portugal were treating people with chronic pain and they had, uh, you know, just invited them into the surgery and half of the participants were given like a big box of placebo pills that was very clearly labelled you know, placebo pills take two a day. So there was no question there was um, an inert substance, but they also gave them this like presentation on mindsets, things like, you know, how when you believe you're taking a placebo pill and you think it's a painkiller, that the brain can actually produce its own endogenous opioids. So it actually has its own inner pharmacy that it's kind of mining to produce its own painkillers that then bring you real relief uh, to your pain. So the the participants kind of knew then that, you know, the placebo effect could be powerful. And they were told, you know, you don't have to like force yourself to believe in this. You don't have to like say a mantra, but you do have to actually take the pills. And a week later, they'd shown a 30% reduction in their symptoms, which is the clinical threshold for any new painkilling drug. You know, it's what, when you consider a painkiller to be effective, it's that 30% reduction or more. So David Robson, thank you for being here. Um, Thanks so much for having me. You know, it's a really big pleasure to be speaking to you. I'm really excited for today's conversation. We were speaking just before we started recording uh, and indeed when we've been emailing back and forth recently because your book, The Expectation Effect, has blown my mind. There are very few books which I read and I just have to tell everyone about. If anybody has listened to the last 15 episodes of this podcast, they've probably heard me speak about this book. It blew my mind. It's similar to Uh, wanting by Luke Burgess did the same thing Mm. you read it and then you can't unlearn what you've learned right it just impacts everything you see so perhaps we can begin here by saying some context what is the expectation effect so it's this phenomenon where we create these self-fulfilling prophecies um through from our beliefs through three different mechanisms which are changes to our perception changes to our behavior and changes to our physiology and actually those those kind of blurred lines between those mechanisms because a change to your perception might change your behavior if you're finding exercise more enjoyable less fatiguing you're going to do more exercise um Similarly, if you're physiologically feeling a lot better when you're doing the exercise, if your performance has been increased because of your expectations, that's also going to make you feel better and then do more exercise. So it's really all of these things. But the upshot is that, you know, by uh, having certain beliefs, we can change lots of important outcomes, including, you know, the effects of medicine, the effects of exercise, the effects of diet, um, you know, the effects of sleep loss, even how long you live. So it's very wide ranging. Do we know when science first caught on to this idea? When, when did the scientific community realise that actually there might be a link between how we expect something to play out and how it eventually plays out in reality? Mm, I mean, so it's been kind of well known in, the, in medicine for you know, centuries, really, that actually sometimes you could give people a placebo pill, you know, just um, made of flour or just a sugar pill, and that actually the expectations that you're receiving a treatment will often uh, kind of relieve your symptoms in some way. Now, it used to be believed that that was just purely subjective. You're just kind of fooling yourself into thinking you're a bit better, especially if you're a bit of a hypochondriac. But actually, the new research over the last few decades had really shown that actually you're seeing physiological changes too. Um, so that was very well established. And then I think what's happened in the last 10 or so years is that actually scientists have started to think, well, that's happening, you know, in hospitals and doctor's surgeries, why wouldn't our expectations also influence outcomes in everyday life? So, you know, the effects of, of, you know, how well you're doing at your workout or, or, you know, when you're eating a food, maybe your expectations could change your digestion. And that's what really excited me when I started writing the book was that actually it's so broadly applicable. And yet it makes complete sense because there's no reason why it would be confined to, you know, just when you're feeling sick. And so an interesting thing here, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, at least in a medical context, placebos are almost as effective in some cases, even if we know it is a placebo, right? So can we take that idea and apply it here that by the end of this episode, once everybody knows the powers of their expectations, even if you know that you're perhaps tricking yourself by setting your expectations that bit closer to what you really want to happen, Mm -hmm. is it true to say that even with that in mind, we can still almost shape our reality that slight bit more? whilst we know what this game is. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think it's... um, So first of all, yeah, like we don't need to deceive ourselves to benefit from the expectation effect. And, you know, I'll just explain that study on the open label placebos, because I think that is really um, kind of fundamental for understanding all of the other expectation effects. But um, essentially, 
you know, in my favourite study, and there have been a few of them, but these um, doctors in Portugal were treating people with chronic pain. Um, and they had, uh, you know, just invited them into the surgery. And half of the participants were given like a big box of placebo pills that was very clearly labelled, you know, placebo pills take two a day. So there was no question there was um, an inert substance. But they also gave them this... Uh, like presentation on mindset. So they explained the things that I will be talking to, um, you know, describing in this podcast. Um, things like, um, you know, how when you believe you're taking a placebo pill um, and you think it's a painkiller, that the brain can actually produce its own endogenous opioids. So it actually has its own inner pharmacy that it's kind of mining to produce its own painkillers that then bring you real relief uh, to your pain. So the, the participants kind of knew then that, you know, the placebo effect could be powerful. And they were told, you know, you don't have to, like, force yourself to believe in this. You don't have to, like, say a mantra, but you do have to actually take the pills. So you have to go through the ritual twice a day of taking these pills. Um, and so they, they went away and they did this. And a week later, they'd shown a 30% reduction in their symptoms, which is the clinical threshold for any new painkilling drug. You know, it's what when you consider a painkiller to be effective, it's that 30% reduction or more. Um, so it was, you know, really useful in this short time for these patients, but they then followed up these patients five years later and found that they still had better outcomes than the other half of the, um, the participants, the control group, who had just been continuing with their previous treatments. So there was something about the knowledge of the expectation effect there that had empowered them, and that empowerment had helped them to manage their pain. Um, now, actually, you know, I think that's true of all of these expectation effects, that just kind of understanding the mechanisms by which your beliefs are changing your outcomes, whether it's your behavior, perception or physiology, that that knowledge is empowering. And then that, you know, can bring about these changes without you having to deceive yourself. Um, but often, you know, I, I consider it to be a very rational process. So when you're changing your beliefs you know, about your own fitness, about your food, about your aging, is that you can actually be quite analytical about it, quite, and you can just start to question, you know, are my previous, like, negative beliefs objective, or is there another way of looking at this that, you know, is not unrealistically optimistic, but is just this kind of sweet middle ground? So that's what I'm really looking for, I think, is to occupy that sweet middle ground where you're open to possibilities of positive outcomes as well as negative outcomes, and that seems to be where you can, you know, get the most benefit from the expectation effect. And this seems to be a recurring theme for lots of the research you look at in the book, which is that um, merely having some sort of professional, be it a researcher or a doctor, whatever it might be, talk to subjects in a piece of research and say, actually, this is the potential positive. Here's some knowledge on, on the mindset you can apply mm. to have a better outcome here. That seems to be a big piece of the puzzle here, just unlocking access to something that isn't plagued with negativity. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think the best example of that is when we're talking about the effects of stress and anxiety. So, you know, I do quite a bit of public speaking, like when I go on stage, like in the past, if I was feeling anxious, which I always would be, because who wouldn't when you're in front of a big crowd? Um, you know, my kind of racing heart, like the butterflies in my stomach, I would see that as a sign that I was going to fail because it felt so uncomfortable. I thought like this can only be... Um, a bad sign of imminent failure and you know like I have to control that I have to suppress those feelings um but the researchers found that actually suppressing anxiety is pretty much impossible it often makes it worse because you're adding this other layer of anxiety when you're you know anxious about your anxiety and suppressing uh, trying to suppress it isn't really going to get rid of that um so instead they just looked kind of from an evolutionary um an evolutionary point of view um, to say, well, like, what is the benefit of anxiety? Like, we wouldn't have really evolved this response unless it was actually beneficial. So they, um, you know, they explained to the participants that actually, you know, when your heart's racing, like, you can start to feel like you're in a bit of a panic. But actually, that's pumping lots of oxygenated blood to your brain, which helps you to think more clearly. And, you know, those levels of hormones like cortisol that kind of spike, you know, in the short term when we're feeling stressed, well, Actually, you know, that is keeping you alert. And who wants to kind of take an exam and feel kind of drowsy or, you know, give a talk and be like so sleepy, you're not really paying attention to the audience. Um, so they, they found that actually just explaining these potential benefits of the anxiety 
without getting, without pretending it's a pleasant experience, but just saying, you know, you don't have to worry about the anxiety itself. You don't have to see this as a sign of failure. It could actually be a sign of, you know, success. Um, that people actually perform a lot better when you tell them that. So it's, you know, improved um, scores in really difficult exams. It's better public speaking without showing so many outward signs of nerves. You know, it's performing better on the sports field. Um, and even more importantly, it also then changes the way you recover from the stress afterwards. So it changes, you know, your cardiovascular response. So your heart actually returns to normal much more quickly. You know, the balance of hormones you actually, in addition to that um, cortisol, you also get these beneficial anabolic hormones that help to kind of maintain your tissue and to, to rebuild it. Um, and so actually changing your stress mindset is not just good in the short term, it's actually protecting you from the long term effects of stress that might come if you're doing these kinds of difficult events, you know, day after day, week after week. Um, so it's very profound. And it all comes from actually just explaining the science to people. It's like knowledge is power in this case. And there's no way that's deceptive. You're just telling people that there's two sides to this uh, situation and you've just been neglecting the positive side of it. With that knowledge that you now have, to, to look at some more examples in your life, you spoke about reframing uh, nerves before public speaking, which is actually something I've had to do with this podcast. Um, you know, it's three years in, maybe two years into speaking to guests. And every single time I sit down with somebody like you, any guest, I am by definition the least qualified person in the room, right? I, I read a book, I kind of wing a conversation, I have to hold it together. And I used to shit myself before stuff like this. It was terrifying. But actually, I mean, you probably clocked it in the beginning of the conversation, right? I just explained all the reasons why this is exciting and why these nerves are definitely a, a sense of me being excited and not nervous. Do you have any other examples in your life that you've taken from the research you've read and then reframe something else to better manage your expectations in your life? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the big one, I think, has been exercise, which I've briefly mentioned, but um, just to kind of describe how you reframe that. So, you know, I was the youngest person in my year at school. I was always like the last in the race, you know, like I very much felt that I was just never going to be good at kind of exercise and it was always going to feel difficult. Um, but actually reading the research, there's so much good evidence now that those perceptions in themselves can be self-limiting and that actually, you know, for some measures of, of kind of stamina and endurance, like the gas exchange in your lungs, your expectations of your fitness are more important than the actual genes that you're holding. Um, so that was really eye-opening to me and it just led me to reassess, you know, what, you know, what was the objective basis for me to think that I was just literally not cut out for exercise at all? Like there was you know, there was no reason for me to to think that actually with like regular workouts, I couldn't improve, that I couldn't get pleasure out of it, even if I was never going to be this kind of Olympic athlete. But, you know, you don't, there's lots of reasons to um, work out besides like winning a race, you know, like just for your general health and well-being and longevity. Um, so, you know, I started questioning that. And then I looked into the literature about how you can reframe the feelings of exercise themselves. So in much the same way that when you're feeling anxious, you can perceive those feelings as a sign of failure. When you're doing exercise, you know, when you're aching, when you feel out of breath, when you feel tired, you can see that as a sign of your lack of fitness. Or you can kind of flip that on its head and acknowledge, you know, which I think is more, the more objective and actually rational way of looking at it, which is that when you're pushing your body, you know, hard, like that's actually just a sign of growth and like you're not going to grow unless you feel those feelings. So they're actually something to be embraced and almost you should aim to make yourself feel like that if you want to get the most out of your exercise. And the research shows that that can, you know, that kind of thing can like reduce your perceived exertion as you're exercising. It can also help to trigger things like um, the release of endorphins. So you're more likely to kind of get that runner's high afterwards. Um, and that just seemed to be like totally transformative for me. So it did improve my performance at the gym. Um, it made it just a lot more enjoyable. So I went from being this kind of reluctant kind of gym goer, like a, I felt like I was an innate couch potato that was trying to be a gym bunny to actually just really looking forward to kind of every workout and finding the routine of, of working out to be like really essential for my mental health. So it was a complete transformation and it all came from just like reassessing my beliefs and expectations and what I think is quite an objective kind of way. So we've looked already at a couple of examples. I want to dive into a few more examples in a moment from the book, the ones that just really stood out to me as impactful potentially in my life. But before we do that, um, 
we're a few minutes into this conversation now. People might be listening to this and thinking, yeah, you know, I've heard this all before. I just need to close my eyes and wish for things. Like this is this nonsense manifestation repackaged. But you're careful in the book to say that this is not the secret, right? The book that I have never read, the secret that every author I know just shits on because it seems to be this, this terrible kind of ideology that you can get what you want without the work. This is not that. So how is this different to woo manifestation? Yeah. I mean, this isn't, you know, the secret at all. And, but I don't, I also think if people have read the secret and they feel that they've benefited, well, you know, I think there's a reason it's been so popular. And I think it does tap into our kind of intuition that our mindset really makes a difference to our life. And actually, if you can manage to have a positive mindset, you know, in general, I think that will mean that you'll recognize more opportunities that are out there. Like you're just more likely to see them. You're more likely to feel kind of brave enough to go for them. So there's not. There's probably something in The Secret that I think is genuinely useful. But what I object to is this idea that there's this kind of cosmic law of attraction. That if you have positive energy, then positive things will just come to you automatically through some kind of, you know, fake kind of quantum mechanical force. Or I can't I can't remember how she um, describes it. But, you know, there's no scientific basis for that at all. It's not it's not about kind of just having good energy. It's just about these very fundamental, you know, psychological and physiological mechanisms. And we have to be really careful not to develop, like, you know, not to think that the expectation effect can perform miracles. So just, you know, imagining yourself getting rich, that's not going to help you to get money. Because like you said, you have to put in the work, you have to be, get the, you know, you have to seize those opportunities and, you know, uh, some of it's just going to come down to luck too. Similarly, you know, there's been a lot of, um, like, I think crap written about, like, um, you know, if you're optimistic about your cancer diagnosis, you're more likely to survive. And I just think that's putting too much pressure on people with, you know, with really bad news to feel good. And I think that can actually be damaging. That's actually increasing their stress. So, you know, with the expectation effect, I'm, really looking at um, having realistic expectations. You know, that's been proven by the scientific literature. Like I cite more than 400 peer-reviewed articles. It's all been very well established, you know, what can work and also what can't work. It's got very clear limits. Um, I think those are the main differences. And um, yeah, I think that's it really. I'm not asking people to be this, you know, to um, believe in miracles, just to believe in the science and to look at the very specific mechanisms that I'm describing. Am I right to suggest, uh, although I haven't read The Secret, and I'm always careful to stress that then, that actually what might be going on with some people who find success with the ideas laid out in that book, as you said, because if it works for somebody, it works, is that actually those who read the book and benefit from it might actually just be experiencing the expectation effect. They may just be slightly realigning their expectations of what they want to happen and then moving through it in a more scientific way, wrapped up in the idea of the secret. Yeah, exactly. That's why I think they, you know, they're probably being pragmatic in the way they apply it. Um, But, you know, I know someone who, like, um, didn't get a job, was never going to get a job, was never going to try to, like, you know, do any kind of project to make money, but he really believed that he could just like lay on his bed and visualize himself getting rich and that he would win the lottery or something. Well, that is the kind of manifesting um, that I just think is never going to be helpful. And it's actually impeding people from reaching success. But, um, but other cases where people are just like taking a more positive attitude and, you know, doing these things like reframing and, and recognizing that actually, you know, there might be a positive side to a, an uncomfortable situation. You know, I think that is, kind of beneficial. And if people are taking that from the literature on manifesting, so not just the secret, but you know, all of these other books, then I think that is beneficial for them. So let's dive into some examples. Um, The one that sprung to mind straight away when I knew that we were going to be having this conversation is that just by chance, when I was reading your book, a friend of mine texted me and he asked if I was still using my whoop band, which if you don't know, it's like a health and fitness tracker thing that tracks your heart rate and a bunch of variables, plugs it into an app, and then it gives you like a sleep score and a recovery score. And essentially, the higher your sleep and recovery score, in theory, the more exertion you can do in any given day. And I replied to him and I said, actually, I stopped using it because although I religiously tracked my sleep every night for about two years, I eventually reached this point where I realized that actually 
it wasn't necessarily my quality of sleep, which was dictating how I felt in any given day, but rather the number on a screen when I glanced at my phone in the morning, right? If, if the Whoop app was telling me that despite the fact that it feels like I've had a great night's sleep, my recovery score is 17%, then I would operate for that full day at 17%. And so I felt like there was almost this kind of negative feedback loop going on. What did you learn in the research about uh, complaining bad sleepers? Mm, yeah, so there's, you know, a load of studies that have tried to compare like objective measures of sleep to subject people's subjective perceptions of sleep. And they found that there's this um, sizable group, I think it's about 20% of people who are complaining good sleepers. So they actually, you know, get seven or eight hours um, sleep a night, you know, might be a little bit disturbed, but really no more than average. But when they do have a disturbance, um, or, you know, if they have you know, just less sleep than they normally would do, they really catastrophize that. Like, they really think that, like, that is a sign of, like, um, uh, it's like, um, they really see that as being, like, a sign that the day ahead is going to be, you know, a bit of a disaster. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So they do actually experience, you know, the um, fatigue, irritability, loss of cognitive function that they would have experienced if they actually had lost a whole night's sleep. And then that's contrasted with this second group who are the non-complaining bad sleepers. And, you know, when you look at them objectively, like they aren't sleeping as well as they could be. Like they do have disturbances. They are missing out on some sleep each night. But they are much more kind of laid back about this. They kind of focus on the sleep they did get rather than worrying about the sleep that they missed. Um, and they, you know, seem surprisingly... Um, uh, you know, well adjusted to their life, like they don't have any of those symptoms of insomnia that we would expect. So, you know, the contrast between these groups is really striking. And then, you know, the the worst combination really is when you have a genuine sleep deficit, and you catastrophize that. And that's when you see all of the kind of whole spectrum of symptoms of insomnia, including the um, physical effects like the heightened blood pressure. So it's really a combination there of bad sleep and bad expectations. Is there a case to be made uh, back on this piece of speaking about knowledge being the unlock for lots of this, that actually there is a, not to use this uh, phrase in the wrong context, but a curse of knowledge in some context, in as much as, um, you know, I read Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker a few years ago. And now if I reflect on the first, say, 24 years of my life, I got the worst sleep ever. Like I would, I, I was running a business when I was in school doing my GCSEs and I look at the kind of absolute lack of sleep that I got between trying to do exams and run this business. But I felt absolutely fine, right? I read that book by Matthew Walker. I got a little bit scared into the idea that if I'm not getting seven and a half hours sleep a night, I'm going to get this big long list of diseases. And then almost immediately after reading that book, for a good couple of years whilst tracking my sleep, if I wasn't getting that sleep, I would feel dreadful. It's almost as if it was the, the insight into the ability to feel bad that made me feel bad, not the lack of sleep itself. Mm, yeah, I mean, so, you know, I really respect Matt Walker, and I think it is a great book. Um, but I do know some uh, kind of sleep scientists and cognitive behavioural therapists um, who and doctors who've been quite worried that it has actually like massively increased people's anxieties about their sleep, and that sometimes those anxieties can be more of a problem than the sleep loss itself. So I think he did a great job in like highlighting the importance of sleep for our lives. And, um, you know, I do think if you're regularly having like a poor night's sleep, you know, genuinely, objectively, it's a poor night's sleep, like you should get help. And actually, if you go for like cognitive behavioral um, therapy for insomnia, you know, that can also help to correct some of the negative expectations that you have around sleep, you know, can actually stop you from catastrophizing. Um, so actually, it is really useful at correcting your beliefs and, and improving the way you cope with sleep loss. So absolutely, I think like, you know, you should get treatment. It's not just a case of like ignoring serious insomnia. But, um, but I do think also, yeah, there's this kind of, um, that maybe like, we should just bear in mind, like if you've read Matt Walker's book, that actually just the occasional bad night is not going to be catastrophic. And that actually, um, by, you know, being a bit more um, blasé, maybe about, you know, a small disturbance that you'll actually function a lot better. And you might actually, you know, then get a better night's sleep the next night. Because what we do know is the more anxious you are about getting to sleep, the harder it is to get to sleep. So the worst thing is for you to be lying there um, thinking about, you know, all the bad things that are going to happen the next day, 
if you don't get to sleep because that's going to stop you going to sleep and then it's going to make you function worse the next day as well due to the expectation effect. So something else you might be able to give me the other side of the argument on in that case then is willpower because I have sat on this podcast countless times and literally used the phrase verbatim, we know willpower is finite and I have peddled that until uh, the, the cows come home, right? And yeah, I read your book and you said that that's not the full story, that actually our willpower is in some way connected to our expectation. So what can you tell me about willpower? Mm, so, I mean, <clears throat> it seemed, uh, you know, really strong, this idea of ego depletion, that the more you practice willpower, so whether that's doing difficult cognitive tasks, you know, focusing on your work, resisting temptation, that, um, that that's easily depleted. And um, this seems to be linked to, you know, the amount of glucose in your brain that was available. So it's literally just your brain's running out of fuel. And so it goes back to the it's kind of impulses because maintaining self-control and willpower, you know, that takes energy. Um, but then the recent research showed that actually, you know, this is true, but only if you believe it to be true. So it's an example of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the reason that we measured this and have noticed it. And the reason all of that research came out was actually that belief has been very prevalent in the West for quite a long time. Um, but what's um, surprising and quite amazing to me is that it doesn't seem to be so prevalent in other cultures. So in India, for example, people seem to have more of the belief that, um, that actually willpower can be um, kind of self-perpetuating, like you gain momentum. And I think we can kind of, you know, in some situations in the West, I think we do actually recognise that. It's like when you get in the zone, um, once you're in the zone, then actually like you, your work can feel almost effortless. And I think that's the idea that you see in these other cultures is that, you know, it takes a little while to kind of warm up your brain, but once you're focusing, you know, that can um, have its own momentum. Um so, you know, then you do all of these tests of like um, willpower and concentration. You know, you have like a deplete, what's meant to be a depleting task. And then you have like another task that requires a lot of focus and concentration or um, self-control. And what you find is that people with this belief that willpower can actually be um, self-maintaining, that it's non-limited, that those people actually show increased focus and self-control the more that they've been using their willpower. So it actually you know, they sustain it. And in some cases, they actually increase. And then we've seen this, this evidence also in lots of um, real life studies, you know, looking at students or um, people at work, that what you find is that people with that non limited belief about willpower, the fact that, um, you know, you become stronger, the more you use it, um, that they tend to have better outcomes, you know, in their exams, with their health and fitness goals, you know, even with their kind of what they do in the evenings, they're less fatigued in the evenings. So they actually then, you know, can put work behind them and find it easier to kind of enjoy themselves and pursue their other goals rather than just kind of slumping in front of the television. Um, so, you know, it has real life effects that are really important for people. Um, and, you know, it seems that it can be, it is malleable, that we can change our mindsets. So, you know, just trying to think of, of a time in your past when maybe you did get into the zone and you really found your focus quite easy to maintain something like um you know it could be something at work or it could be like reading a really good book where you just didn't notice the hours pass and then it was like one in the morning you know it just recognizing that you do have that capability and then kind of building on that trying it out like trying to maintain your focus over longer periods that seems to be really successful at changing those mindsets to pick up on a few examples we've covered so far then so you spoke about your view towards your inability in earlier life to exercise. We spoke about uh, my chronic fear of getting no sleep for a bunch of years in my life. And then we just looked at the idea of willpower. In all of those examples, it seems like the thing that is getting in our way of doing is actually ourselves. So with the expectation effect in mind, how much do we just get in our own way? Mm, uh, quite a lot. So I think that we, it will vary, like depending on the particular you know, kind of domain that you're looking at. And I think that's what's also really important here is that like we know that optimism and pessimism, you know, seem to have some kind of role in these expectation effects. And by optimism and pessimism, I mean, if it's a gen general kind of personality trait, but actually most people are not like wholly optimistic or wholly pessimistic. We're like a big like mishmash, you know, like you might have positive expectations about your fitness, but, um, just believe that your willpower is like severely depleted after even the smallest task, you know. Um, so actually, we have to think very specifically about the 
a particular expectations and the particular outcomes. Um, but in general, I think when we do have these negative expectations, I see them as being like a kind of break um, on our performance. So we might be doing, you know, all of the things that we know we should be doing. We might be trying really hard to improve our fitness or to go on a diet or to improve our sleep or to deal with stress. You know, we might be meditating every day. We might be doing all of those things. But if you have the negative expectations, if you have that tendency to catastrophize, like, you know, the um, situation, then that is going to just hold you back and stop you getting the full benefits from what you're doing. And so that's the aim of the expectation effect, I think, is to really complement all of those other lifestyle changes that we know are useful and to, to make sure that they're kind of easier to apply and then just more effective. You're like boosting the benefits. Now, this, this next area I want to focus in on, I have been very invested in for the last month because we were chatting just before we started recording. Actually, we had to move the date of this recording because for the last four weeks, three of those four weeks, I've had some sort of cold or flu or COVID. I don't know what it was, but basically I was recalling the chapter in your book about how your expectation of recovering from, I believe the research is a common cold, can be reduced if you have a plan in mind of how you expect to recover. I'm not sure it worked in this case. I just feel like I've been in bed for the last month. However, I think the area of illness and recovery when it comes to our expectations is very interesting. So what did you learn about those domains? Mm, so, I mean, the, the cold study, you know, I do love that. And essentially it was looking at um, the way that doctors talk to patients about you know, these kinds of illnesses where they don't really, they can't really give you like a treatment, like there's no real cure for the common cold. Um, but the doc, the way the doctor speaks to you can actually have a big impact still. So his words can actually be biologically active, I say. And, you know, in this particular study, they found that if you go to the doctor and um, he or she, if they are really, you know, empathetic and warm, and also like try to just give you a bit of information about how quickly you might recover so if they just say you know this is kind of um self-controlling and that actually you know your body can deal with the virus quite well and you should be better within a few days if they give you that positive information um then you actually do recover more quickly and that's you know can be seen in measures of like inflammation within the nose and also people's just self-report of like when they felt able to get back to work and you know how how, uh, whether they were still experiencing any of the symptoms. Um, we see that also with things like rashes. You know, if you have an allergic reaction, sometimes there's not much a doctor can do to, um, you know, apart from just tell you, like, it's nothing to worry about. But actually just those words, like, it's nothing to worry about, it will go down very quickly. Um, that in itself can help the rash to feel less itchy and for it to kind of um, shrink more rapidly. So it's really, you know... What what we're told by our doctors can have a really big impact. Um, now, it can have like even more serious consequences, say when someone's had heart surgery. So one study looked at um, an intervention, a psychological intervention uh, for people who are undergoing heart surgery. And they were just given like four sessions with a health psychologist who helped to kind of um, discuss, you know, what they were worried about and maybe, you know, untangle some of that catastrophic thinking. So they weren't expecting like the worst to happen and you know actually showing and actually just explaining to them well like this is like the kind of trajectory that you can expect to have like you know without being overly optimistic but it's just that if you you know at this point you you should be able to do these exercises at this point you might be able to go on holiday you know just helping them to kind of have a realistic but optimistic view of their recovery and they found that actually you know that had a really powerful effect on the patients' experiences. So they actually left hospital um, a few days earlier, which already more than covers the cost of the psychological therapy itself, you know, because hospital beds are really expensive. Um, but then, you know, according to other measures of their, you know, uh, disability, their ability to return to work, you know, all of those were um, better outcomes than the people who just had a very standard treatment in the hospital. You know, everything else was done perfectly fine. They just didn't have this additional psychological help to set positive expectations. And those differences could even be seen in physiological measures, so like levels of certain inflammatory markers within the body. And we know that's important because, you know, bodily inflammation uh, can make us feel sick. It can slow, you know, the healing of wounds. You know, it can actually just um, make the whole process of recovery a lot, a lot slower. And for these people who had the positive expectations, that just seemed to be reduced. 
So as we look at this, this COVID backlog, as it's being called in the NHS right now, not to suggest that the singular unlock here is just a shift in mindset of patients, of course not. But do you think that either the NHS as a whole or doctors on an individual level um, take seriously enough the the psychology that goes into physical recovery. Does that make sense? I've never gone to a doctor for a do- mm. don't get me wrong. I'm fortunate. I've never had anything particularly wrong with me, but I've never gone to a doctor yeah. and been told that a mindset will help here. And yet in lots of the research that you've uncovered, that seems to be the case. Are we taking this seriously enough? Mm, you know, so I've been really pleased with doctors' responses. Like they have, um, I haven't really had any criticisms from doctors, but I have had a lot of nice responses where they've said, you know, we, like we do understand this and we they do try to apply it, I think, in in their clinics, even if they're not explicitly talking about expectations, I think they do try to um to, you know, set them up just in their conversations basically and to kind of reassure their patients and then to try to um kind of help them to be as optimistic as is realistically possible to be, um, while still, you know, being honest and, and uh giving the full facts. Um so yeah, I think this is I think it is acknowledged. I think it maybe there could be more formal training around this to make sure that, you know, more doctors are doing that. Um, I think that could be really useful. Um, and yeah, like I do think, like, say with that trial uh, that was in Marburg, Germany, the one of the people with the um, heart surgery, you know, I think if that is replicated in like more trials and it's really proven to be um to work, then actually that is something that should be rolled out just more generally, that actually if you're undergoing heart surgery, you should receive psychological therapy that will help your recovery and by changing your mindset. So staying in the vein of physical health, what can the expectation affect teachers about eating, about food, about diet, about weight loss, about all of these things that are clumped together? Mm, So, I mean, with dieting and weight loss, I think it really tells us that we have to... um, kind of it emphasizes the importance of pleasure in food and actually getting satisfaction from what you eat because what happens is that if you you know if you're on a diet or trying to control your weight and you know I've never really been on like a strict diet but I often do you know temporarily cut calories for a few weeks but it can be quite a depressing period because you know if you're only focusing on the number of calories not the pleasure you're getting from food um you know, you're often not enjoying your meals very much. And what's happening is that that's setting up a kind of mindset of scarcity and deprivation. So um, if you become overly focused on like what you're missing, you're basically telling your brain that you're not getting enough nutrients. And what happens then is that those expectations, they kind of shape how you're, you know, processing information from your gut. So, you know, we we have these sensors in the gut that kind of tell us how much we've eaten, but it's quite messy data. And if you believe you've had like a, a meal that's too small and not going to be satisfying enough, well, actually, you then process that data as if you, you literally haven't had enough to survive. So you feel hung, more hungry, less satisfied. And um, But also it can change the hormonal response to foods. So um, in one experiment, participants were given uh, the same milkshake on two separate occasions, so no no change in its nutritional value. Um, but all that was different was the labelling of the the milkshake. So in one, they were, you know, it, it kind of showed like they had seven hundred calories. It described the milkshake as being kind of decadent, luxurious. It emphasised like how much ice cream had gone into the milkshake. Um, so it felt like a really big treat. And um, on the other occasion. The participants were told that they, you know, the milkshake was just this kind of sensible health shake, you know, not really very appealing. It was meant to be the kind of thing that would help you to lose weight because it's replacing what you really want to have, which is the um, luxurious shake. Um, Now, the while the participants uh, ate that milkshake, the researchers measured their ghrelin, which is a, a hormone that controls appetite. It's called the hunger hormone because the higher Uh, level of ghrelin you have, the more hungry you feel. Um, Now, typically when we eat a meal, you know, ghrelin might um, kind of spike uh, because, you know, you're kind of getting ready to be satisfied and your, you know, your brain and your your body is telling you to eat. And then it drops dramatically because you feel, you know, you've, you've got what you needed and you don't need to hunt for food anymore. So you don't need to feel hungry. Um, And that's exactly what happened when they had the milkshake that was labelled as being like luxurious and decadent, 
But when they had the health shake, the ghrelin level just barely changed at all. It was almost as if they just hadn't eaten. Um, and, you know, ghrelin's important because it's it's going to make give you those hunger pangs that make you kind of, you know, miserable and make you want to reach for the cookie jar later on. Uh, but actually, it could also play a role in metabolism. So it might actually, if your ghrelin is high, um, it might actually make you kind of a bit more lethargic and um, make your cells burn less energy. So it's a real double whammy for dieters. Like the worst thing you want to do is to have a food um, and then not have like a drop in ghrelin because it's, you know, it's not ticking any of the boxes for how you feel or how your body should be responding to the food. Um, now, you know, this all just shows us that actually like when we're dieting, like we still need to focus on you know, making each meal a celebration, even if we're cutting calories, we want it, that meal to feel like that luxurious, decadent milkshake. Um, you know, we want that mindset of indulgence. So we should be focusing on adding, you know, um, all of the delicious flavors that we would normally have. We should make sure the food looks really delicious. Um, beforehand, we should be kind of anticipating it. So, you know, deliberately like imagining how delicious it's going to be when we eat it. You know, all of that is going to help you to to have that kind of more beneficial ghrelin response and to help the body to better process the signals it's getting from its gut so that you do feel satisfied from the meal. And so you don't just um, kind of, your mind doesn't just register that you essentially haven't eaten, which is what's happening a lot when we go on a diet and we're only focused on cutting the calories. I remember picking up on a, a broader point in the chapter around food and uh I guess the the food labeling piece. It, correct me if I'm wrong. You used a list of words that you may find on kind of low calorie health food relative to a list of words you may find on some decadent foods. And with my marketing hat on, so my day job, I run a marketing agency. So I, I I try to understand the power of particular words. I made this connection that actually, yes, the words that we use in response to food change how our bodies react to the food. But actually, is this not true more broadly? The way we label, I don't know, a relationship, the way we label our chances in a job interview, it is those words that actually uh, shape the reality. Yeah, it is. You know, so yeah, the example of the food labeling is really important. You know, diet foods are often labeled as being like sensible, light, you know, low fat, low sugar like other foods would be, it would be that kind of decadent, um, delicious, you know, you'd have more foods just literally labeling the flavors, um, you know, like, uh, the gooey chocolate or whatever, or the, um, you know, like, um, like, you know, like sweet and crackling sweet potatoes or something, you know, it's all of those kinds of descriptors that are just missing. So there's nothing really, um, inciting like sensory pleasure when you're having a diet food. But like you say, I think, the words we use are important in all kinds of situations. And we mentioned another example earlier. You know, if you reappraise your anxiety as excitement, you know, that can have an effect. So language really is powerful. Um, and I'm sure it's true in lots of other situations. Um, we, you know, there's often, there are lots of ways of describing what you're going through. And some words are less loaded than others. Some have more positive connotations than others, and just selecting them carefully can really change our experience. So I want to finish at the beginning. At the beginning of your book, you have a quote from John Milton. The quote is, the mind is a place of its own and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. And the reason that quote, when I reread the book briefly a couple of days ago to plan for this conversation, stood out to me is with the benefit of having read the whole book, and I now understand why the quote is there at the beginning, that is what this book is about, right? That is what this this whole uh, idea is about, that our expectations shape our reality. They shape what we experience and what we don't, who we become and who we don't, what we do and what we don't. And so perhaps we can end here with everything you've learned in writing this book, in living your life. What can those listening take away? How can we better manage our expectations to live a better life? Yeah. So I think the first thing to recognize is that, um, you know, like uh, that Milton quote is great. And I think what, what we need to remember is that actually it's like your expectations, like changing your expectations will have like an immediate effect, hopefully. So, you know, reframing your anxiety just before a talk will make that talk um, a bit more successful, a bit easier for you to handle. But that actually we're looking for a trajectory. And I think that's really important when we're um, talking about the 
expectation effect and applying it in any domain is to, you know, hope for some benefits and you will see them, but actually then to look at the kind of bigger picture and to recognize that it's kind of, you'll be seeing these improvements day after day, week after week, but you have to keep on applying it. I think you can't just think that you'll change your mindset once and that's it works over. Like it's something that you do have to work at like anything important in life. Um, same with fitness, same with sleep, you know, it's the constant kind of questioning of your assumptions. Um, I think, you know, if we then look at um, the tools we can use, well, reframing is just really important. And we've given those examples of reframing anxiety or reframing the feelings of um, fatigue in your muscles, um, you know, seeing them as a potential for kind of growth. And I think that can be applied in lots of other situations. So if you're at work, you're feeling really frustrated, you know, you're facing a problem and you just, or maybe, you know, a creative kind of writer's block and you're really struggling to kind of um, see your way out of that particular problem. Well, actually recognizing that that frustration is itself really useful, that actually like all big breakthroughs come after a period of frustration. It's actually a sign of your brain, you know, grappling with the problem. Um, so again, that can be reframed. And I think, you know, so many of the things that we um, term kind of negative emotions can actually just be reframed as holding some kind of important meaning, some kind of purpose for us, that they're actually helping us in some kind of way. Um, I, I think like we should also recognize that, you know, sometimes it's going to be hard to change our mindsets. Like if you're stuck in the middle of a difficult situation and someone says, oh, you know, don't stress or, you know, like, um, oh, see, you know, the glass half full rather than half empty. That can be really frustrating. And we, you know, have to accept that. But when in the moment, it can be difficult. But there are tools to help you with that, too. And my favorite one is um, a technique called self-distancing. So that is where you, um, rather than like immersing yourself in your problems, you kind of take a step back and imagine that you're talking to like a good friend who's facing exactly the same problems. And what the research shows is that when we have this small psychological distance um, from our problem, that that can actually help us to be more objective. So you'll naturally start to look at maybe the positive alongside the negative. You might naturally reframe your frustration as something that's essential. Um, so that is something that we can apply if we're really struggling to, to use the expectation effect. And finally, I think we just need to also have like self-compassion. And I think maybe this is something that's missing from you know, some other elements of the positive thinking literature, that there can be a sense of guilt that like, if you fail, that must be because your mindset was wrong. And like, you know, you have, like, it's all, all the kind of um, responsibility lies on you. But actually, you know, there are so many reasons why like things might not go perfectly kind of day to day. And again, you know, a, a small failure, you don't have to beat yourself up about that because, like, you're focusing on the big picture, like making incremental changes. Um, so just try to be kind to yourself. Um, you know, if if changing your mindset really doesn't seem to be working, like, give it a break or maybe try to apply it to another domain in your, your life or maybe just go back and, like, take a smaller step outside of your comfort zone. You know, test it in a, a lower risk situation the next time and see if you can kind of prove to yourself that it, it works then before trying something more ambitious. Um, but yeah, those are all of my tips really. And essentially I just think like, just have fun, experiment with it, keep an open mind and just avoid that kind of catastrophic thinking. You know, if you ever get into those negative ruminative cycles, just do try to step out of that and just ask yourself, is there another way of looking at this? What's the objective basis for this belief? Is there also evidence that, you know, my the situation might be better or more positive or more adaptive than you think? You know, just applying all of that, I think, is is the key to this, really. And, you know, over weeks and months, you might be really surprised by what you achieve just by, you know, using all of these psychological tools. Amazing. David Robson, I'm going to make sure that your book, The Expectation Effect, is linked in the show notes below. If people want to go elsewhere to find you, to find your work, where can they go? Um, so they could go to my website, um, davidrobson.me. Um, I'm on Twitter, you know, if that still exists when this <laughs> goes out live. Um, I'm D underscore A underscore Robson. Um, I'm also on Mastodon uh, with the same uh, same name. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm on Instagram at David A. Robson. But I do really love hearing from readers and, you know, answering questions. So, yeah, please do get in touch. Amazing. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a great conversation.